if you were asleep late last night, you might have missed it because a little report came out about Paul George and possibly the Clippers gauging the market for his services. So you know what? Maybe that's something the Memphis Grizzlies should entertain. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some other players as well, including Kyle Kuzma, who's been a fan favorite this summer in Memphis. And with the draft one day away, we got to go through some draft options. We got all that coming up right here, right now on Locked On Grizzlies. You are Locked On Grizzlies, your daily Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Hump Day, everybody, and welcome back to Locked on Grizzlies. I am your host today, DeMichael Cole, beat writer for the Commercial Appeal here in Memphis, Tennessee. I want to thank you for tuning in to Locked on Grizzlies on today. Uh, we appreciate you guys for listening in each and every day. Make sure you continue to listen to us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. If you want to watch YouTube, wherever you like to tune in to Locked on Grizzlies, we surely appreciate it. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Uh, the, the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more. All you have to do is visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Well, today to get started, we got some news from the one and only Mark Stein and his latest Substack on Tuesday. And, and I think I mentioned it the day before. I said, Mark Stein's one of those guys. If he, he comes out with a bombshell report, it's a pretty good chance uh, that there is some real good intel in there and the latest uh from mark stein centers around paul george and it is the paul george uh, will be available this summer uh for the los angeles clippers and kind of caught me by surprise kind of caught me by surprise because uh paul george uh, as, as you can I mean he's one of the best shooting guards in the game and it feels like the clippers uh, over the last four years they've only gotten one real run at this thing where injuries haven't greatly impacted uh, their their core in terms of Kawhi Leonard, Paul George. Uh, the one year it felt like they were healthy was the bubble year. And ever since then, I remember they made the Western Conference Finals. Uh, Kawhi Leonard got hurt in the round uh, before that when they beat the Utah Jazz. They took down the one seed. They lost to the Suns in the Western Conference Finals. Uh, Paul George pretty much was the main player in that series. The next year, Kawhi Leonard doesn't play. Uh, and then you look at this season, Kawhi Leonard starts off in the postseason, I mean, looking like prime Kawhi Leonard, but Paul George isn't available in the first round series as they lose to the Sun. And then Kawhi Leonard gets hurt after game one. So uh, you haven't seen this core really put it together yet. But here's what Mark Stein said, you know, in this latest uh, sub stack uh, where he mentioned the possibility of, of Paul George being traded. He said, league sources tell the Stein line that the LA Clippers have left various rival teams with the impression through their draft week uh, conversations that they are at a minimum attempting to gauge Paul George's trade value and to hear some describe it, giving real consideration to the idea of disassembling the Kawhi Leonard, Paul George tandem. Now, again, it from a basketball standpoint, it's a reason the Clippers are always one of the trendy teams to be projected uh, to be in the NBA Finals because that Paul George, Kawhi Leonard tandem seems to work when it's healthy and the pieces around it. Uh, they got a nice group there. They got a scrappy team. They have a nice little identity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them in a second from that standpoint. But the health standpoint is, is, is why I get it, which leads me to what we all want to talk about here, and that's if – should the Memphis Grizzlies get involved in this? Because there are a lot of moving parts. If you talk about a Kawhi Leonard, uh, Paul George breakup here. And for the Memphis Grizzlies, my short answer, yes. Yes. Get involved. Because Paul George would feel that need at small four. He's also a guy who has been one of the best scorers in the NBA over the last decade. He also feels that great defender need. He also fits the Grizzlies' kind of identity from uh, 
a standpoint defensively of having all these guys who are very disruptive. There aren't many guys in the NBA who are better at getting deflections and steals and just getting their hands on the ball uh, than Paul George. That is something he specializes in on defense. So he fits all around, not to mention the three-point shooting that the Grizzlies have missed. Paul George can knock the ball. He can put the ball in the basket uh, from beyond the arc. Let me see. Let's let's play around with why this makes sense from the Grizzlies standpoint. Other than clearly Paul George is a superstar talent that you add. Uh, I want to point out a, a few reasons why the Grizzlies should get involved here. And number one, the Clippers just don't have a lot of draft flexibility in the upcoming years. Uh, they have they the Clippers do not own their own first round pick in NBA draft outright until 2027 2024 this year they have a first round pick but it's the 30th basically the last pick in the first round a pick that they got from the milwaukee bucks so they don't own their first round pick in this year's draft 2025 that draft pick is also being shipped out 20 no i'm sorry 2025 is a draft swap with okc so they have a draft swap with the thunder in 2025 meaning if the thunder Uh, were to finish in in the lottery again and and were to have the number 12 overall pick and the Clippers were to have the eighth overall pick, uh, the Thunder have the rights to draft swap and say, hey, we want your eighth pick. Basically, if the Clippers end up in a higher uh, position, uh, the Thunder have the ability to swap that. Okay, so they have a draft swap in 2025 first round. 2026, OKC owns this is all from the Paul George trade from Oklahoma City Thunder. 2026, Oklahoma City owns the Clippers' first-round pick. So the Clippers don't have an outright first-round pick until 2027. They don't have a pick, period, right now in the 2026 NBA draft, not even a second-round pick. So this team needs draft capital, and the Grizzlies are one of those teams that actually have it. The Grizzlies have a 2023 first-round pick that we've kind of talked about that could be dangled here at number 25. They have a Golden State's pick. Uh, going into next season, which is a little bit more interesting now because of the Draymond Green situation. We have to watch how that plays out. But they have a Golden State pick in the first round. They also have their own first pick in the first round next year. And then they have all their first round picks going forward after that. So the Grizzlies are a team who can say, hey, look, we know you don't have a pick for 2026. Here, here's the here's first round pick for 2026. Here's a draft swap in another year. Uh, that's one reason. Another reason is the Clippers have a point guard need. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, They're in the market for CP3. There's a reason they're in the market for him. There's a reason that reports are also indicating that they want to bring Russell Westbrook back. Clearly, the Clippers are zeroing in on the need of a playmaking point guard. Guess what the Grizzlies have off the bench? One of the best fill-in backup point guards in the NBA who actually probably deserves a chance to start at this point of his career, and that's Tyus Jones. Uh, The Grizzlies could center a package around Tyus Jones, which would give the Clippers their starting point guard. Uh, yes, the Clippers lose Kawhi I mean, lose Paul George. They lose some scoring, but they still have Kawhi Leonard. Uh, Terrence, man, I, I really like his game. He, he can hoop. Uh, and, again, they have a bunch of other wings. I mean, Norman Powell is a bucket getter. Eric Gordon can fill it in. A lot of guys over there that can really score the basketball. Scoring is not what I'm worried about as it pertains to that team. But uh, – the Grizzlies can center a package around a point guard, which has been one of the main weaknesses. If you look at the Clippers over the past two, three years, of uh, the ball uh, basically will get stuck in Kawhi Leonard, Paul George's hands, and none of those, neither of those guys uh, made it to the NBA because of their playmaking skills. I'll just leave it at that. But improved playmakers for sure. But I think what Kawhi Leonard probably has two or three triple doubles at this point in his career, and then Paul George, a uh, great ball handler, but not known uh, as for his playmaking, uh, so to speak. Finally, let's get into the nuts and bolts, the financial side of this. Uh, The financial side of this is why it would be tough for the Grizzlies to pull off a a Paul George trade. Uh, Make no mistake about it. This would not be easy. Uh, And and the the main reason is because Paul George is owed $45.6 million this upcoming season. Then after that, he has a player option, and that number goes up to around 47, 48 million. But let's start it at the 45.6 million number because the Grizzlies, they don't have to necessarily match that number. You just got to get in the ballpark. Just got to get close to it. And in that case, 
Uh, we mentioned Tyus Jones. Let's throw out a couple other contracts. Tyus Jones, let's say Brandon Clark gives gives uh, the Clippers a little bit more size, uh, explosive uh, big who can come off the bench, score some points for you. A uh, nice little offsetting big to what uh, Zubac brings to that team. Tyus Jones and Brandon Clark get you at around $27, 28000000 million. So, okay, let's add in one of the young wings. Let's add in Zaire Williams, top 10 pick. Uh, he's going to be owed around $5 million, uh, close to $5 million this upcoming season. Those guys get you around $32, $33 million. Quite, I mean, Paul George is at $45 million. So, basically, you may still need another a nice, decent-sized contract with the Grizzlies, and they don't have many more. At this point, uh, you're talking about a guy like Luke Kadar possibly being included, and you're familiar with the show. You're familiar with the name Luke Kennard. You know, Luke Kennard actually just came from the Los Angeles Clippers. So with that being the case, guess what? You're probably going to have to include a third team in a potential deal to get Paul George. Uh, it's, unless you're shipping out a whole bunch of salaries, uh, the uh, the alternative to Luke Kennard would be Steven Adams, which doesn't make sense because Zuba doesn't make sense. So we would have to zero in on the idea of trading Luke Kennard, which would be tough, but it's Paul George. So I think it's worth it. But it had to be a three-team deal. Uh, it, I don't see the Clippers saying, sure, yeah, bring Luke Kennard right back over here. So uh, the Grizzlies would have to find a way to get another team involved, move some picks around and all that. But – from a financial standpoint, first and foremost, uh, Tyus Jones, Brandon Clark, Zaire Williams seem like a starting point that should get shipped out uh, to the Los Angeles Clippers. And then you have to throw a couple picks in, maybe 2024, 2026, uh, and then add maybe a 2029 or 2028 draft swap, 2027 draft swap, whatever the case may be, because the Thunder need it. <laughs> the Thunder don't outright control their own first round pick until. I mean, not the Thunder, the Clippers. The Clippers don't outright control uh, their own first-round pick into the 2027 uh, NBA draft. But there is a route. I can see the Paul George uh, trade potentially happening because of what's happened with the Clippers, and they're getting to a stagnant point. But I've also said that I expect the Clippers to try and remain competitive as possible because of the fact they're moving into their own you know, arena out, I think, in Inglewood out there, and they put some money into that thing, got all the bathrooms in the world. Uh, I see the Clippers trying to be as competitive as possible, and trading Paul George might not be conducive to that. So we'll see how it plays out. We'll continue to monitor that situation. Can't wait to see what Joe has to say about that, too. That's the trade machine guy. Can't wait to see what he has to say about that. But I can't wait for you to hear what I got to say about Kyle Kuzma. A lot of people have been throwing the name Kyle Kuzma out there as a fit with the Grizzlies. Um, I'm indifferent about it. Talk about that coming up on Locked On Grizzlies. But before we get to that, I want to bring up today's episode, the sponsor, FanDuel Sportsbook. Look, make every moment here. All you got to do is go to fanduel.com slash locked on. The thing about FanDuel is baseball season is in full swing right now. There's no better place uh, to get in on the action than FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book because right now new customers get a no-sweat bet. First bet of up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. Don't miss your chance to snag a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. Man, you can't beat that. FanDuel is the official betting partner, partner of Major League Baseball, but it's not only baseball. You can go bet on boxing. Uh, you can go bet on the college sports out there. You can go bet on whatever. Uh, I saw some, some. I mean, overseas basketball games popped up on FanDuel the other day. Wherever you want to bet on. And remember, FanDuel is where you go. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Go check it out now. Coming up on Locked On Grizzlies, we're going to talk about sign and trade candidates. And we're going to zero in on one in particular. And that's Kyle Kuzma. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back, everyone, to Locked on Grizzlies. I am your host today, DeMichael Cole. Going solo without Joe Monax. He should be back with us on tomorrow. Can't wait to have Joe back as we zero in on our draft coverage. And we're going to do that a little bit later, too. We got more uh, to talk about in terms of draft prospects. So stay tuned for that. But before we get to that, we're talking about all these possible candidates at small four because there's a wide net to cast. We remember earlier 
Uh, we did an episode, I think two, three weeks ago, on some free agent candidates. You know, we, we mentioned Jay Crowder. Joe wasn't too happy, but I mentioned him as a name. We threw out some other guys, Bruce Brown, uh, Karis LeFert, basically your bargain shopping uh, type options out there because uh, free agency, the Grizzlies only had the mid-level exception, which is $12 million a year. We've also talked about the idea of trading for a player. Uh, this is a DePaul George example that we just talked about. This is also, you know, a guy like OG Ananobi, Mikael Bridges, uh, those type of players, Royce O'Neal, Dorian Finney-Smith. We talked a lot about those guys. Then there's the other option. Haven't talked as much about it, but there's the other option. And that's the sign and trade options available uh, this offseason. Now, sign and trade are basically the top tier free agent small forwards that we haven't talked much about because the Grizzlies don't have the cap room to sign these guys outright. But you can move, maneuver some pieces around and make this thing work uh, with the sign and trade, guys. Uh, a few names come to mind. Kyle Kuzma, Cam Johnson, Jeremy Grant, Harrison Barnes, Josh Hart. Uh, the first name I kind of want to uh, maybe I'll, I'll just say rule out pretty much is Cam Johnson. I know, I mean, I think this guy, Cam Johnson, is probably one of the best fits for what the Grizzlies need right now. If you put Desmond Bain and Cam Johnson in the same lineup with Luke Kennard coming off the bench, we immediately go from the Grizzlies being a middle-of-the-pack, mediocre three-point shooting team to one of the best three-point shooting teams in the NBA because you're going to have elite shooting on the floor at all times and maybe even two elite shooters on the floor most of the time. Completely changes the way the Grizzlies look on paper and on, on the floor. But getting Cam Johnson is probably close to unrealistic, and here's why. Yes, he's a sign-and-trade option, but you got to remember this. Uh, there are multiple reports out there uh, that have said Cam Johnson, before uh, last season with the Phoenix Suns, turned down a four-year deal worth the 70, worth $72 million, $18 million per season. You know what that tells me? He's looking for a nice deal <laughs> that could be – Upwards of $22, $23 million per year. We're talking maybe four years, $92 million, four years, $90 million. Basically, around the Mikael Bridges contract that he got uh, from the Phoenix Suns last summer. With that being the case, there are going to be teams out there that can, can go out and sign a Cam Johnson with salary cap space to an offer sheet. Remember, uh, since he's a restricted free agent, uh, the Brooklyn Nets will have, I think, 48 hours, 72 hours to agree uh, to the offer sheet and basically match it and bring him back or say, hey, that deal is out of our price range. We don't want him at that price. He can sign with that team. The Grizzlies are not one of the teams that can offer uh, Cam Johnson an offer sheet. On top of that, the Brooklyn Nets, I was reading comments from Sean Marks uh, with the Brooklyn Nets recently, basically saying uh, Cam Johnson knows that the intent in Brooklyn is for him to be back. So not only will there be outside interest, but the inside interest in Cam Johnson is very, very high. So basically the only way that the Grizzlies could acquire Cam Johnson is if no, despite the offers that he gets out in free agency uh, from other teams, he says, I'm not going to agree to any of these offer sheets. I want to go to Memphis. And Brooklyn says, okay, you want to go to Memphis? Fine. That's fine with us. And they ship him out via a sign and trade to the Grizzlies. Do I see that happening? No. So with that being said, I'm not going to talk too much about Jeremy Grant, Harrison Barnes, Josh Hart uh, on this episode. I want to zero in on probably the flashiest option of those guys, and that's Kyle Kuzma. Because Kyle Kuzma is – a name I've had, I've seen people mention in the Locked On Grizzlies comments. I've seen people uh, email me about this guy, Twitter DM. Uh, we talked a lot extensively about Kyle Kuzma uh, off of the show. Now it's time to bring it on the show. Offensively, I get the Kyle Kuzma love. He's coming off of a season where he averaged over 21 points per game, career high. Uh, Three-point percentage is not great. You know, talk about 33 34% three-point shooter, but he's going to shoot it. He's going to make over two three-pointers per game. Uh, he's going to get his shots up. So quite frankly, teams, because of his aggressiveness, aren't really going to leave this guy open too much. Uh, the off-the-dribble game is there. Uh, he's played power forward. He's played small forward. He's played on a championship team. 
I like what he could bring to the Grizzlies offensively because if you're getting Kyle Kuzma, you're starting him at small four, which brings me to the downside. Uh, I do believe that Kyle Kuzma has improved as a defender, not taking anything away from that standpoint, but I don't think Kyle Kuzma is the defender that the Grizzlies should be targeting to put in that starting small forward uh, position because, again, John Morant, Desmond Bain, uh, not – necessarily known as a uh, top of the line defenders in the NBA. Kyle Kuzma not known uh, for that in the NBA. And guess what? In the Western Conference, you're going to go against Paul George. You're going to go against Kawhi Leonard. You're going to go against Kevin Durant. You're going to go against Devin Booker. You're going to go against Luka Doncic. You're going to go against LeBron James. You need <laughs> you need wing defenders or you're going to get toasted. Believe me. You're going to get toasted. I mean, uh, look at what Aaron Gordon did for – uh, the Nuggets during their championship run, guarding Kevin Durant, guarding Jimmy Butler, guarding, you know, Devin Booker in stretches when he would get hot, uh, guarding, you know, uh, I mean, Carl Anthony Towns. You know, you, you need these type guys who can say he's got him no matter what. I mean, and, and Aaron Gordon was that guy for the Nuggets. Kyle Kuz would – Probably won't be able to be that guy for the Grizzlies. Uh, he did, you know, I, I went back and watched some some stuff on him. And I've looked at the numbers as well. Because the numbers when it comes to defense, it's an inexact thing, right? You got to go back and watch when you're talking about defense. It's very much an eye test statistic. And one of the reasons why, because Raptor, defensive Raptor is one of my favorite uh, analytical statistics in terms of uh, how defenders grade out. Uh Kyle Kuzma graded out as the 88th best defender on 538's uh, defensive Raptor uh, stat this season. 88th best defender in the NBA. John Moran, Xavier Tillman, Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson Jr. were all higher among Grizzlies players. Not only that, and this is why it's an inexact stat, because you know who was lower uh, than uh, Kyle Kuzma on this? Mikael Bridges was lower. Uh, I think OG Anadobi was lower. And I think uh, Jalen McDaniels, who I voted for second team all all defense was tied, but uh, again, so it's an inexact uh, science to you know defense and determining uh, because if you look at the eye test, those guys that I just mentioned, uh, they get after it on defense. Kyle Kuzma does a decent job of standing in front of guys. Uh, he's a little bit bigger. Uh, wouldn't say he's the quickest laterally uh, on his feet when it comes to moving his feet. Here are some other numbers, maybe a little bit more simpler. Uh, he had a he had a career worst defensive rating this past season, 116.6 uh, defensive rating. He also had the lowest defensive uh, box plus minus of his career, minus 1.5. He's been minus in defensive bo uh, box plus minus in his entire career. Even when the Lakers won the bubble uh, championship, when they won the championship in the bubble, excuse me, uh, he was not seen as a positive from the defensive box uh, plus minus uh, area at that sample. So, no matter how you slice it, the defensive numbers analytically aren't in favor of Kyle Kuzma. Again, looking at him on, on paper, he does do you know a good job of staying in front of certain guys uh, with the Wizards. He took on some pretty good matchups uh, until uh, Avica would get in the game. Uh, Dene Avica would get into the game, and then he'd move off those matchups. But overall, I don't think this is the guy. Yes, he adds a lot to you offensively, but I think getting a defensive upgrade – and you don't even need a great score. You just need someone who can knock down shots. We talked about the Royce O'Neal, Dorian Finney-Smith uh, type players out there. You don't need the greatest offensive player because between John Morant, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., you're going to get over 60 points of offense between those three guys. And then you should get uh, somewhere between 15 to 20 points uh, from guys like Luke Kennard coming off the bench, Brandon Clark, Xavier Tillman, whatever the case may be. Uh, they're going to get a lot of points uh, from those players. So – that's where I am on the Kyle Kuzma talk. Mm, I wouldn't say he's a top candidate for me if push comes to up. He says, hey, I want to come to Memphis. It's something you entertain. And not only that, you also got to get this guy through a sign and trade, which we've talked a lot about uh, up to this point in the episode on the idea of sign and trade. So we're going to talk a, one more time before we really dive deep in on the next episode about uh, draft prospects. We're going to talk about some guys that the Grizzlies should entertain at 25, some draft options. But before we get to that, I want to talk to you guys about better help. Uh, better help is simply if you're thinking of starting therapy, 
you should give better help a try it's entirely online you don't have to go in person with anyone it's designed that reason because it wants to be convenient flexible and suitable to your work schedule suitable to your daily life uh suitable to your family schedule just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist and the reason for the questionnaire is you fill out the questions and BetterHelp will then determine which therapist best caters to your needs and your wants. And if you feel like that therapist is not a match for you, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. BetterHelp is where you go to find more balance with your life. All you have to do is go over to BetterHelp right now uh, to take advantage of that. A better help will help you become the best, the best, the very best version of yourself. And today's episode, betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA is where you go. Again, you go to betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get that help. Coming up on Locked On Grizzlies, we're going to talk about NBA draft prospects. Again, these are some guys that I talked to Jay Billis about, and we're going to see row in on these names. Stay tuned for that. Coming up on Locked On Grizzlies. Welcome back to Locked On Grizzlies, everyone. And the NBA draft is a day away. I know we've been talking a lot about uh, these guys the Grizzlies could potentially get involved with uh, from a trade standpoint or free agency standpoint. And look, personally, I can't speak for everyone else. Personally, I've zeroed in more on that content because of the fact that the Grizzlies got one open, open roster spot. I've talked a lot about this, quite frankly. They can't draft three players. They're going to have to wave. They're going to have to trade. Something's going to happen. They can't just say, hey, we're going to add these three guys to the roster and ho home, move on. Can't happen. Not enough spots. With that being said, there are some really good draft prospects out there that fit what the Grizzlies need. And what I want to focus on for today's episode is shot creators who can come off the bench and potentially – make an immediate impact. Why I want want to focus on shot creators? Well, if you look at what the Grizzlies did last year, Jake LaRavia, David Roddy, Vince Williams, all those guys can kind of thrive in spot-up shooting roles. If you watched David Roddy this past season, you knew that a lot of his shots were spot-up three-pointers. Same thing for Jake LaRavia, and that will be the case for Vince Williams if and when he gets playing time uh, for the Memphis Grizzlies. So, those guys aren't really known for having a lot of wiggle off the dribble. Jake Ravy has got a little bit in this bag. David Roddy can get downhill. But other than that, these aren't guys you, you're saying come off the bench to be your, your Lou Williams, your, your you know, uh, Monte Ellis, your Jamal Crawford. Like, the Grizzlies don't have that guy right now. And we've seen in stretches how that has impacted this team, especially in the postseason uh, when John Morant, Desmond Bain, you're dependent on those guys to do a lot of the scoring because – Luke Kennard, as great as he is, teams are being more physical with him in the postseason, and they're eliminating uh, his open three-point attempts, forcing him to take some tougher shots. And outside of that, John Conchar isn't doing much off the dribble. Uh, Zaire Williams, we haven't seen it yet. I think it's in the bag, but we haven't seen it yet at this level. So with that being the case, I think the Grizzlies don't necessarily have a guard or a wing need because they have a lot of depth there. But if they were to get a guard or a wing, you do not zero in on a guy who's just going to be sitting in corners taking spot-up three-pointers because they already got enough guys to do that. You go get a guy who can create his own shots and can knock down shots. A couple guys that come to mind for me, uh, one is Bryce Sensabaugh. This is one of those guys uh, from talking to Jay Billis. He believes is one of the best, not only one of the best shooters in the draft, but one of the the most ready to be impactful uh, from day one. Bryce Sensabaugh played at Ohio State, shot over 40% of from three-point range, 6'6", 235-pound frame. So what I like about him is seeing with Ohio State, he was capable of playing some small ball there, uh, potentially a guy you can throw down in the in the small ball four row, uh, but he also is capable of playing the three. You know, the, the Grizzlies last year prioritized getting those tweeners at three and four. He's another guy that can feel uh, that type of role uh, with some re- with a real good shooting stroke. The concern, the reason Bryce Sensabaugh will probably be available in that range is because defensive concerns. Uh, doesn't really stand out on that area yet. It's probably going to take a couple years to really uh, get after it on defense. Uh, just one year in college. So uh, probably got a lot to learn on that side of the ball. 
Uh, Derek Whitehead is another guy that comes to mind. Whitehead was one of the top recruits coming out uh, before he went to Duke, and everyone was talking about this guy. I remember all my friends were texting me, talking about how good he is, whatever the case may be. Uh, he is a talent, big-time talent. But you saw he got to Duke, dealt with a foot injury, and I think it limited his explosiveness. And we saw how that played out in his numbers, and it's kind of – the reason there are certain concerns about his games, three-point shooting, terrific. Over 40% from three-point shooter shooting as a freshman at Duke, averaged only eight points. Uh, one of the bigger concerns with him is more turnovers than assists. And maybe you can say, oh, well, his foot was, you know, uh, you know, not healthy for a decent part of the season, which limited his explosiveness, which probably limited his ability to drive and penetrate uh, maybe get some drive and kick type assists uh, that you expect from an off-ball guard uh, like himself. But at his best, remember, this is a guy who's a top prospect. Uh, he can fill it up. He can fill it up. He's proved that when he played for Team USA on the circuit. He proved that when he played for Montverde, which had a bunch of talent on that team, and he stood out as the guy. So don't get it twisted. Uh, very talented guy here, another one that I like. Another one that I want to point out is uh, Wami uh Vasquez from UCLA. Uh this is a guy I actually ran into out there in Los Angeles when the, the Grizzlies were playing the Lakers and we were going into uh the training facility at the same time. And as he was walking in, I was like, shouldn't you be preparing for the draft? He says, Yeah, that's what I'm about to do. But uh this guy three-point shooting probably doesn't give it, you know, not the level of three-point shooting that the Grizzlies want at this point. You're talking about a guy who, over the past couple seasons, shot below 33 34% from three-point range. But you go back to his sophomore year, because this is a four-year player. Go back to his sophomore year, he shot 38 39% on three-pointers and made more than one per game. So the ability is there. But this is a mid-range maestro. Excellent footwork, probably some of the best footwork in the draft. I mean, I love his mid-range game. He can create. He has the fadeaway. He has the turnaround. He, he knows how to just stay on that pivot foot and just spin around and have you have defenders spinning around getting off their feet. Uh, this is a guy I really like out of UCLA. Uh, he can really be one of those off the bench spark books in terms of giving you a different score. He also two time all defensive Pac 12 player. I'm not sure how his defense translates to the NBA level because he's not the most explosive athlete by any man. Yes, he has nice quick hands, average over steal per game. Uh, last few years, but overall, I think he is a guy who could get to the mid range, get to his spots, and really be efficient for the Memphis Grizzlies. Those are three guys uh, that I think uh, make a lot of sense uh, for the Grizzlies. Now, uh, we appreciate you for tuning into Locked On Grizzlies. Don't miss out on Locked On NBA Draft Live on Thursday night. Pick by pick analysis from our stable of local NBA hosts, national reaction from our NBA big board hosts, and live check ins from inside the NBA draft. Locked on NBA draft live is starting at 7 30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 30 East, uh, 6 30 p.m. Central on the Locked On NBA YouTube page. So make sure uh, you check that out and you tune in uh, with us. Uh, during the NBA draft as well. But before we tune into the NBA draft, make sure you tune in tomorrow's episode. Me and Joe Monax will be back together with an all-out NBA draft breakdown, how the Grizzlies can do well in the draft, what would be considered a good draft, bad draft, all of those things. We got you covered on the next episode of Locked on Grizzlies. But until then, want to appreciate you guys for tuning in to Locked on Grizzlies. Then just remember Locked on Grizzlies is free and available wherever you get your podcast. Until next time. See you again on Locked on Christmas.